Okay, so this is your first page of notes. Um, so last week we talked about how to get the line of best fit. We talked about correlation. We then put our data for handout five into the calculator. We got the line of best fit. We got the correlation and we interpreted it. We practiced predicting and we practiced um, calculating a residual. Now there's two other main pieces for linear regression that we need to go through right now. Um, first, these two things should already be in your notebook. Um, but remember, how are you going to know what the x and y variable are? We always, in mathematics talk, we predict y based on x. And then remember, if I ask you to predict, you can only predict inside the original x data range. But this next one is one of the two really big interpretations that you're going to need to do for me for linear regression. Um, it r makes your life so much easier if you go ahead and memorize what I put in quotes verbatim because um, you're going to have to you know, give that back to me on the handouts and on the test. So there's something called the coefficient of determination. It literally is the square of R, so it's R squared. You'll see it on your calculator output or of course you could always square R. And what I have here is, so this is what you need to memorize percent of change in y that can be explained by the linear relationship between x and y. So this is telling you exactly how much is coming from the one variable you studied. So for example, um, in class we would have talked about this a lot more but I'll kind of shorten it up since we're doing a video. But Let's think about residential homes. Think about a neighborhood. You know, all the homes are sort of kind of similar. They probably all feed into the same school system. You're probably not going to have a $2 million home and a $200,000 home. So, you know, homes are kind of similar. But they are different prices. So think about all the variables that go into why a home is a different price from its neighbor's home. There's number of bedrooms. There's number of bathrooms. There is where your garage is located. My house is always worth a little bit less because my garage is up underneath the house, like part of the basement, as opposed to being attached, you know, to it. Um, whether you have a pool. <clears throat> when it comes to actually selling your home, you know, the idea of whether you have granite countertops, carpet, hardwoods, all of that stuff plays into why different prices, why homes are different prices. One of the biggest things is probably square footage, how big your home is. Um, so with linear regression though, we're only allowed to do one variable at a time. See, in real life, it's multivariable. All of those variables go into why we see different home prices. But we don't do multivariable in Math 220, so we have to pick a variable. So let's say I picked square footage. I looked at how much the homes cost in the neighborhood versus how big they are. And let's say, for example, I'm going to make up a number here. Let's say I came up with an R squared of 0.8. I'm going to turn that into a percent. It makes a nicer sentence. I could say 80% of the change in price can be explained by the linear relationship between square footage and price. So as I said that out loud, from an English standpoint, I guess we don't need the word that. Um, so what that means is that 80% of why I'm seeing different prices is from how big the home is. That's not bad. Um, that's kind of like getting an 80 on your test, right? There is 20% that I'm clueless about. 20% I didn't study. 20% from other variables, such as number of bedrooms, where your garage is, do you have a pool, do you have hardwood floors, all those other real life variables. So this is why I'm a fan of R squared and not necessarily R because this tells you exactly how much you know. It's just not this sort of weak, moderate, or strong. This is what I was referring to. It's kind of like going to a tailor and having them make your jeans perfectly fit. It's telling you exactly how much you know. So now we're going to go to handout five and we're going to practice making this sentence for the quitting rate wage problem. You don't necessarily need to put that data back in your calculator. Since we had written down what the R was for handout five, we can just square that and we will have R squared. 
All right, so from handout five, I just kind of stuck it over there. You don't have to see it. You can look at yours. Um, our R was negative 0.85. I actually had written down the R squared from the calculator at the time, so it turned out to be 0.7286. So we're doing part C now. What's the coefficient of determination and interpret it? So we're going to say 72, I'll round it to 0 0.9. 72.9. Hold on, you can't see what I'm writing. 72.9% of the change in our Y variable was the quitting rate. And quit rate can be explained by the linear relationship between quit rate and wage. Okay, so that's the exact interpretation you need to give me for part C. 72.9% of the change in quit rate can be explained by the linear relationship between quit rate and wage. So that's the interpretation, but now let's talk about it, make sure we understand what that means. I mean, that's not bad. Um, that's kind of like getting a 73 on your test. Now, you know, when we interpreted part B, we actually said that negative 0.85 was strong. I'm not sure that I would call, you know, some, knowing 73% strong, and that's why I've always said I'm not a big fan of R. It's a starting point, but I much prefer R squared. So we can see exactly how much we know. 73% is coming from um, why people quit. It's coming from how much we pay them. So then I always go on and I ask another question. Why might this not be 100%? What I'm getting at with that is apparently there's 27% from other variables that I didn't study. I'm clueless about 27% of why people quit. So at this point, it's really just opinion from you. What are other reasons why people quit besides how much I pay them. So that's what you on a test just need to give me one reason. I'm going to list a couple right now, particularly from what people were telling me maybe on the Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. Why else do people quit besides how much we pay them? You hate your boss. You had to relocate. The hours. Maybe you didn't get enough. Maybe you had too many, maybe the hours were just awful for your school schedule, whatever. So whatever all those other reasons why people quit their job besides how much I pay them is, you know, you just want to give me one of those. All right. Now we're going to go and talk about what I mean by interpreting the slope and then we'll come back to handout five and practice it on this one. Okay. So to me, interpreting slope truly summarizes the relationship of a problem. So I think it's really important. I have put up a little sentence here. It probably looks awkward and it doesn't look like it makes sense. But I promise you, if you memorize that and you learn how to, of course, you know, relate it to the word problem we're doing, it's going to make a really nice sentence. I just want to give you a tiny bit of background down here as to why that sentence up there even makes any sense. Remember slope? It is the change in y over the change in x. Well, think about it. If we let x just change one unit, maybe going from 3 to 4, 10 to 11, or whatever, if we let the change of x be 1, so there's now a 1 in the denominator, well, then it turns out that the slope is just the change in y. And that's what I've put up here. As x, now I can't tell you if it's going to increase or decrease just because we don't know the particular problem, right? But as x either increases or decreases, one unit, that one is critical. You can't, you know, it has to, you can't leave that out because it came from that, yes, if I had a one in the denominator, then slope is the change in y. So as x increases or decreases one unit, comma, y is going to either increase or decrease by whatever that slope number is. And the increase and decreasing, remember, if your slope is negative, you've got to make one of the variables go up and the other variable go down. If the slope is positive, 
then you need to make both variables go up or you make both variables go down because negative over negative makes positive. So we're going to practice making this sentence for our handout five. Let's see if I can get that back up here. So back to that handout five. Make sure you know where to get the slope from. Of course it is the slope in part A, it's what's connected to the X. So for handout five, I'm attempting to interpret this negative point, I'm going to round it a little bit, negative point three, four, seven. Okay, since I see that the slope is negative, I know I got to make one go up or one go down. So right now, again, I'm doing part F on handout five. So I'm just going to use that little template sentence that I just gave you as, okay, my x variable is wage. So you can either pay the people a dollar more or a dollar less. It doesn't matter. How about we pay them a dollar more? As wage increases one dollar per hour, those are the units, so I just use the dollar sign per hour, one dollar an hour, quit rate. Now, since I made wage go up, I have to make my quit rate go down. Decreases um, 0.347. I'm going to look back at the problem on handout five and see what the units are. They're kind of awkward units. It's like people per hundred. How about people per hundred? Okay, so that was the unit of it. Now make sure you noticed, I did not put a negative here, even though the slope was negative. I used that negative in my increase-decrease. You could have said as wage decreases, quitting rate increases. That's your choice. But I took care of the negative by making one go up, one go down. Because, you know, if you put a negative here, then you're kind of doing that double negative thing and it doesn't make sense. The value you use here will just basically be the positive of it. So this sort of summarizes. Um, at this point, you are welcome to then go multiply both of these numbers, you know, by a particular value. Um, you could say, this probably doesn't make that much sense. Be uh, how about if I just multiply by two? As wage increases two dollars an hour quit rate decreases I am multiplying by two quickly off here to the side 0.694 people per hundred okay you can do that I will say the book has some really nice problems that are very similar to this um, but this is like, I guess, what I call the foundation. We're changing it one unit, and the other change is the slope. But at that point, once you get the foundation, you could multiply both of those by five if you wanted. You could divide, you know, those by a half or something, or divide by two, you know, 50 cents and whatever half of that is. So you can play with it once you get your foundation, and you will see some of those in the book. So it just kind of summarizes for every dollar what's going to happen to the quitting rate. All right, so that is going to be it for this video. You need to watch the second video, which there's a little more wrap up and it practices handout six number four, which is probably one of the harder problems because there's three different variables and you're going to have to really keep up with where you put your X's and your Y's and how you refer to them on your calculator. We're not just going to be doing L1 comma L2. You might be doing L3 comma L1 and you have to get very good at how do you know, you know, what L's you're running. Also, as I typed on the email, you need to become an expert on linear regression today and tomorrow. Do all of the homework. Handout 5 and Handout 7 are full, complete problems that I have on Canvas. And remember, I've loaded the answers on Canvas too. Handout 6, I pulled four problems from an old book. 
and I've put the answers on Canvas, but you will notice that sometimes on the answer key, I'll even just do a few more things, like maybe I'll interpret R squared, even though the book question didn't ask for it, just to give you more practice. Um, it's a topic that you do well on. You need to practice it all now, so then when it comes time before test two, you might just have to review it quickly, but you want to get this out of the way before we start into probability. Technically, I would have used about, oh, tw uh, 25 minutes of today's lecture to just briefly introduce probability, and I had some fun stories to talk about. All oh, my fun stories, I suppose I'll be able to cut those out since they're technically not relevant to test material. So when we start back on Thursday, I'm probably going to take five minutes just to put up a couple of general definitions, and then we're going to get started in all into the, all of the probability rules. Make sure you uh, have printed everything that you need um, for all, the module for test two, and enjoy your snow day. So go watch the second part of the video now.